All right, thank you all for being here. So I would love to introduce our panel of avian taxonomy experts. First, Dr. Pamela Rasmussen, for me, she's on the left. Um, Pam holds several distinguished titles, uh, but the one we're most proud of right now is uh, Senior Research Associate Avian system, systemat, uh, Systematist at the Cornell Lab. Pam joined the Cornell Lab earlier this year, coming to us from Michigan State University. So hello, Pam. Hi, thanks. Looking forward to it. Great. And uh, Dr. Bo uh, Sean Billerman is science editor with BOW. Hello, Sean. He has a deep expertise in systematics, taxonomy, and evolutionary biology. He is a leading expert on bird families and co-authored the book called Bird Families of the World. Hi, Sean. Hi, Laura. Hi, everyone. Excited to be here. Right. And Marshall. Hello, Marshall. Marshall is the project lead for, uh, for eBird and the lead database coordinator who organizes the eBird Clements taxonomy in our system. And he also manages our global names, our global common names data sets. Welcome. Hi, everyone. It's great to see uh, so many people joining from around the world. And I see a lot of familiar users from eBird and eBird reviewers. So thanks to all you for what you do. It's my favorite part. Um, so for this discussion, it's important to point out that both Pam and Marshall serve on the IOU's WGAC or WGAC committee. That is the Internet, uh, the IOU Working Group of Avian Checklists, which we will refer to as the um, WGAC throughout this talk. They both have, well, this means that they both have a front seat at the table when it comes to changes in avian nomenclature. So today, please know that we'll be focusing mostly on higher level concepts related to taxonomy. Um, this isn't really a beginning talk, but we'll do our best to, you know, to, to guide you along. But if for an excellent primer on the subject, you might want to look at last year's uh, video recording and we'll drop that in the chat. So um, Jessica's with me as well. Jessica's going to be ha uh, helping us. Jessica, you want to put on your video real quick, if you don't mind. Everyone say hi to Jessica. Jessica helps us with um, with moderating the chat. And if you have any issues, she can she can help you through that and help us through that if everything crashes during this during this talk. Um, so Jessica will be putting a lot of chats in the link for us as we go on. Thank you, Jessica. All right. Uh, yeah. So anyway, there is um, we'll be putting a chat a link to the to the watch to last year's recording in the chat. If you need to get some background on how this all works, how Cornell Lab does it. Uh, but this year we're we're really focusing focusing on the changes that actually occurred this year. Um, so today's panel discussion will loosely fall into three parts. Part one: provide an overview of the two, 2023 taxonomy update. Uh, part two, each panelist will show a short presentation of species and groups that were affected by the change. And part three, we're going to have the audience Q&A. So let's get started. Um, this webinar is dedicated, again, to the recently released taxonomy update. This is a huge subject we want to cover in as much depth as, depth as we can get to. But before we continue, I'd like to discuss the question that's on everyone's minds this week and last. Um, Marshall, could you help us understand why the American Ornithology, Ornithological Society decided to change the English common names of birds that are named after people, and just how and when will this be implemented? Yes, I can. Um, Wait. Give me one second to get my screen share. Uh, sure. So, um, so I, th I think one of the one of the reasons I have a, a perspective to share on this, I was part of the the um, committee that that helped make um, help review the issue and make recommendations to the AOS prior to the decision. Um, here we have Icterus parasorum. Um, that that name is not going to change. That's a scientific name for what's uh, currently Scott's Oriole, but um, but the AOS did announce that. Um, in the near term, to expect seventy to eighty bird names changing um, in the in United States and Canada, basically. Um, and yeah, so I, I wanted to step step through some of the things to know, and in the process, talk a little bit about about um, how we came around to um, 
to hearing this announcement. So um, 70 to 80 species with ranges centered um, in the US and Canada um, will have English name changes. Um, these are these are the birds that are named directly after a person. So, so eponymous names, um, but this can have no bearing on the scientific name. Scientific names will stay the same. Um, that'll be a really helpful sort of um, area of stability in the bird names as the as the English names are changing. Um, it's also important to remember these are just this is just English. People know birds by all sorts of different languages around the world. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but this is a this is an English names decision. Um, and the other thing to know is we're all going to have a lot of time to get used to this. Um, nothing's nothing's changing right now. Um, AOS is sort of uh, assembling a group to um, to consider these name changes. Uh, hopefully, come up with some some really good evocative poetic names. Um, but I think we can all expect at least nine months before some of the first names um, start to happen, and and probably many years as as sort of. 70 to 80 birds are considered by this group and um uh yeah just just really trying to trying to do this process in a deliberative way i think i'm not part of aos in any way that's um that's generating these names but um but we're all watching and interested um the other thing i would say is that you know i mean change, change is hard it's going to be hard for me to relearn scott's oriole as something else i've known it as scott's oriole for 35 40 years now um and uh, and I, I think this is a time that we all really need to be sort of open-minded to to the people that you know may feel strongly that they support these names changing or are worried about the implications of sort of disrupting nomenclature. Um, both of those are like totally valid feelings right now. But I, I think for all of us to just be like really open-minded and really listen. Um, and that the starting point I recommend for anyone that's interested in this is to read the report that we actually actually published on this because we did have a have a committee of about 10 people that looked at this thought about this really carefully for uh, for almost two years and the final report gives a lot of the rationale for um you know why we felt that that um removing removing eponyms in in the in the americas was a was the thing to do and and i think why the aos uh, adopted those um, and then the other thing to, to say at the outset is um, we sit at a really great point uh, sort of in the trajectory of, of understanding birds and nomenclature. Um, and, and we at the Cornell Lab, I, I, think, I think, have a real opportunity to make it easy on everyone um, with the technology that we have in our hands. So, um, so we'll be thinking about how do we, how do we make eBird and Merlin and Birds of the World work in a way that that really helps people adapt to whatever the new name for Scott's Oriole is. Um, we could display both names for a while. Um, we already give users the option to choose the names that they prefer. Um, and I'll talk talk a little bit more about that. Um, um, just from my perspective, like <laughs> eponyms can be really hard to remember. So I'm actually kind of excited to give birds like Gray's Grasshopper Warbler, Palace's Grasshopper Warbler, Middendorf's Grasshopper Warbler, Fusky's Grasshopper Warbler, and Stein's Grasshopper Warbler, different names. And one of the reasons that's super confusing is because Plesky's and Stein's are actually the same bird. Um, so, so there's also an initiative that we're undertaking as part of sort of the collaborative working that we're doing um, as part of the WGAC to collaborate with BirdLife, collaborate with IOC taxonomy and, and our own eBird Clemens taxonomy to try to try to align on more consistent names and reduce cases where we have Plesky's grasshopper warbler and Stian's grasshopper warbler for the exact same exact same bird. But also I think um, reconsidering some of the eponyms can help make these birds more memorable. Um, the other thing to say is like, you know, Bird names change. Like we all know that we're this taxonomy webinar is actually talking about sort of the taxonomic decisions that are driving a lot of these bird names. So this slide is just a just a handful of the species that have had new names. If I grew up in Los Angeles, California, um, and I'm you know have been birding for 35 years, these are the birds that I've had to learn new names for. And this is only half of them. There's actually a, something like 65 birds whose names have changed. So it's not like English names of birds are are this super stable thing. Like, you know, we revise the species limits on solitary vireo, and suddenly we have blue-headed vireo, plumbeus vireo, and castings vireo to to relearn as birders and understand um, both that these are 
species in their own right and learn these new names. So I, I do sort of view this in the context of, um, yeah, we don't want like instability for instability's sake, but it's not like, you know, this is the first time anyone's had to learn a new bird name. Um, and, and that sort of tees up just this update this year. These are some of the birds that had co just common name changes, no taxonomic changes. Um, on the left, we have what we formerly call the white crowned coal, um, but is now white crowned cuckoo. And that helps align with um, the IOC list, the, the bird life list, and aligns better with sort of the taxonomy that this bird is not related to other things that we call coals. Um, there's a lot of swifts in the world. So these center two are two swifts that had name changes. The top one is um, what we used to know as Polynesian swift, but is now Tahiti swift. And that's just a, a better, more accurate description of the name. And it also, also advances this alignment of common names across global taxonomic authorities. The other one is, a, is an eponym that was lost this year in this process of aligning names. This was Alexander Swift. Um, but it's endemic to the Cape Verde Islands. So, um, and others have been using Cape Verde Swift for, for quite some time. It helps highlight both where this bird is, that it's very special to that region. Um, so in, in my book, that's a really positive change um, and really helpful to, you know, now I never have a question like, where does Cape Verde Swift live? But Alexander Swift, I'm like, is that the one over here? Is that the one from Indonesia or what is that one? Um, and the, then the one on the right is one that's, um, it's been marbled teal in a lot of places. We've called it marbled teal in the Ebert Clemens checklist, but I think I think marbled duck is the more more preferred thing. There's really no like firm taxonomic um, distinction between a teal and a duck, but um, this is sort of aligning aligning with the consensus view, which uh, is something that really helps helps when people are going to their Ebert lists or Merlin and understanding what they're talking about in their local communities. Um, so I want to talk just quickly um, since I mentioned. We do offer like like a, a dozen, 15 different versions of, of English that you can set in, in your eBird account, in your Merlin account, in your Birds of the World account, basically anything that we have for um, for the Cornell Lab. And if you go to go to this kind of top right, drop down, drop down to preferences, preferences opens this page, and then you have the option to look at common name, um, scientific name, or or display both. And then um, you also have the option to select any of these options of English. So you can already do English for Australia, Bangladesh, um, Hawaii, Handbook of Birds of the World, India, IOC, Kenya, Malaysia, New Zealand, Philippines, South Africa, UK, United Arab Emirates, and the United States. So it's easy to envision how, how we can support people that, that um, really want to continue knowing birds by the names that they've known them by for a long time. Um, but the other thing that's really important is this helps support uh, bird communities all over the world. So, you know, someone can interact with with eBird or um, entirely in Chinese and I can do it entirely in English, but we're still sharing our bird sightings. Um, and, and that gives us, you know, the possibility to see black-bellied plover here in North America, gray plover if you're in the UK and you grew up with gray plover, but you can also see the, the name in Mexican, Spanish and the, middle there or Arabic on the top or Thai on the bottom. Um, and so it, it's really connecting connecting bird watchers around the world by supporting individuals common name preferences. Yeah, that's great. And, and what this does is it allows you to search for the birds much easier than trying to find the birds um, by either scientific name or trying to remember what you know, the U.S. English would be. So that's a really important point that I, I find that a lot of people haven't discovered yet. So if you're on the Birds of the World page, all you need to do is go to the right hand user icon and then click down to uh, down to preferences. And that'll take you over to eBird preferences. And then you can just hit the back button once you've set that. So so thank you, Marshall, for explaining that. It sounds like we have some time to get used to this and there's going to be a lot of opportunities and actually having bird names uh, be descript more descriptive of either where they're at or what they look like. So thank you for that. All righty. So Pam, I'd love to ask you just in a nutshell, uh, how would you summarize this year's update? Well, um, we made a lot of changes, but what I'd like to do is share my screen and go through some of them with you.
Okay. So basically, for people that might not be completely familiar with our system, um, we have a checklist called the Clements Checklist, often also called the Ebird Clements Checklist, that uh, started out as a book written by James Clements and with various updates and now has uh, gone entirely online and gets updated almost every year. And all of the lab's projects, um, including eBird, Merlin, Birds of the World, et cetera, uh, are based on, and uh, yeah, are based on the Clements checklist, the most current Clements checklist. So the updates that, that we made this year um, really, <laughs> really uh, kept a lot of people busy for the last few months, just keeping up with all these changes at the lab. Um, and you will notice changes as well in your eBird checklist and Merlin, et cetera. Uh, and most of the changes that we made this year were based on the decisions of global committees, the WGAC that Laura already mentioned, and also regional committees in the, in the Americas. Um, and again, most of this is part of the WGAC alignment project, which has been going on for a couple of years now. And most of the changes from last year as well were WGAC related changes. That was before I got started on this though. Um, I mean, I was part of WGAC, but I just started at, at Cornell in June. And um, so most of the changes are actually to bring alignment to the three major global checklists that we'll talk about in just a second. But a few of them are aligning with regional works like Eden et al, Birds of the Indonesian Archipelago. Um, some new studies we've managed to, to look at and, and uh, make decisions on those bases. And some problems have been left for later. Hopefully somebody will deal with the Northern Fantail, Ripidura rufoventris in the same level of detail that the Rufus Fantail has now received or even better maybe, and maybe uh, you know, in the future, WGAC will be able to reach a consensus about the obvious need to uh, adjust species limits, presumably recognizing more species in this complex. But we did that this year for the Rufus fantail and, and now uh, the super trap fantail that I photographed in Wetter. Indonesia is one of the many forms now recognized. And this garden sunbird, very common bird in the Philippines, <laughs> is uh, just one of now several um, species of olivac sunbird. And that's not to say future changes won't happen in these complexes, as more is known about them. We actually have very little known about some of the forms of, um, of the olivac sunbird and some uncertainty. But hopefully people will, will become more aware of these issues and uh, do the studies that are needed to refine the taxonomy. We do have enough information in both of these cases based on recent studies to make the changes that we made. So in a nutshell, and that's what you asked, <laughs> um, we've got three species new to science, 124 species splits, uh, 16 species lumped, no, usually nobody's favorite category, right? <laughs> Um, and then that leads to a, a net gain of 111 species. So we've got over 11,000 species recognized now. Um, and that includes some extinct birds as well, of course. We also have a lot of other categories. We have a, a, quite a few name changes. And again, these are mostly for alignment, for correctness, um, like making sure we're using the original spelling or that the gender agree, the, the gender of the species agrees with the gender of the genus, et cetera. And then of course, splits and new taxonomic information. And then we have um, many subspecies changes as well. And this is due to a variety of causes. So several new taxa were described sub at the subspecies level this year or in the past few years. Some that Clements didn't recognize earlier are now described in alignment with other checklists and um, other reasons as well. So, and then I, want to quickly summarize the uh, regional categories of species splits. This is not perfect, I will tell you. Uh, for example, some of the taxa that are listed in, for South America are uh, also have a little bit of occurrence in central, in you know, Panama, but I put them in the South America category. So it's not perfect, but it's just to give you an idea. And I'm off by one somehow. So if anybody figures out how that is, please don't use this as an authoritative um, statement. It's just uh, to give you an idea. 
And maybe Jessica will do that heat map that we talked about later on. Anyway, uh, obviously it's pretty Indonesia centric, also Philippines, continental Asia, but several from Africa, even the, this is all chaffinch. So the chaffinch split leads to four new species. They're not new species technically, but they're newly split species. And I also wanna mention that this does not include the parent species. So um, if I did that, it, you know, if I included the, like if you split the, um, fire-breasted flower pecker into five, but you only get four um, new species or newly recognized species out of it. So um, anyway, and then New Guinea heavy as well, and also quite a few from South America. We did try to, um, we are trying to coordinate with the, the Western Hemisphere Regional Committees, and we'd love to coordinate with other regional committees as well. And hopefully some of you can, um, we can maybe hear from you and, and start coordinating better on those regions. Okay. I think, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. No, that, that's a perfect overview. Thank you so much. Um, so I think a lot of us in the audience are wondering, how did this affect my particular list? And I was wondering if Marshall could tell us how one would go about determining that. Um, so, so there's two two update stories that are that are published. One is sort of the very very technical, all the all the details of the taxonomic changes that that is published on the Clements website that that Pam authored. Um, and then there's another that that we published on eBird that is is really focused towards the eBird audience and specifically has links uh, for each taxa to to double check whether you've seen it or not. So the best the best way to do it we we don't have a fancy way to like you know tell you exactly what changed with your list. But but if you scroll down that story next to each one, it says, you know, um, my data, or my my observations. And, and if you click that link, it'll open the link in your life list to basically see if you've seen the species or not. Um, so that's that's a way to sort of tick down and be like, oh, I know I've seen, you know, I know I've seen an olive back sunbird, but I don't remember which one it was. You can sort of sort of click through. Um, but yeah, checking the checking the Checking the splits, understanding where those splits occurred, where have you traveled, um, what species you may or may not have seen. Um, so yeah, and I mean one thing, one thing that I should say is that uh, when these when these taxonomic updates roll through, um, we view it as one of the responsibilities of us managing eBird to to help people change their data. So um, mm -hmm. so all the you know northern goshawk was was split into American goshawk and Eurasian goshawk, and we have divided all those which is a very easy division into the old world Eurasian goshawk and new world American goshawk on behalf of eBird users. Um, ultimately, you're the ones responsible for your eBird data and to make sure it's accurate. Um, but when a split happens and we're sort of changing the taxonomic backbone, we we try to do that for you. And then that lines up the photos and video and um, all the all the sort of um, yeah. data that's connected to your observations. Right. It, so it's a huge service to be able to respond to the annual taxonomic updates. And 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 maybe just quickly, we could diverge to Sean, just one minute, tell, explain how the editors of Birds of the World make these changes. How yeah, so it, it? It's, it is quite, quite an undertaking um, that we um, engage in um, for um, many months. Um, we're working behind the scenes at Birds of the World to uh, basically try and update every account that has a taxonomic change. Um, and that will involve um, creating new accounts for the newly split species and um, merging accounts when species are lumped and also going through and making sure that we correct all the name changes um, that have taken place. Um, and luckily we have a, a fairly new handy uh, technical um, assistant with uh, those name changes. We have species tags that are automatically linked to taxonomy. So in the future, if those names change again, they will automatically be updated. So nice. hopefully it's a job we only have to do once <laughs> um, right. for those things. But yeah, it's it's a lot of work. and uh, But it's also really interesting getting to um, really dive into what all of these um, new changes are. Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, so now we're going to go back to Pam. Um, you know, I think you touched on who makes these taxonomic decisions. Um, and a lot of people want to know, are these different taxonomic authorities? There's three or four of them. 
are they ever going to come together so that the world only knows one taxonomy? And the answer is yes. Yay. <laughs> Okay, so, so yeah, the, the stated goal at the outset of the WGAC, the Working Group of Avian Checklists of the IOU, International Ornithologist Union, is alignment of the three major global checklists. And those are the IOC uh, WBL, the Clements Checklist, HBWBL. There's also the uh, Howard and Moore that's online and it's not a part of this, uh, it's working independently. Um, and making also major changes. And um, we're collaborating with uh, the, especially closely with uh, the NAC and SAC, North American and South American checklist committees, um, and trying to avoid a, a creating additional discrepancies while preserving the, you know, the freedom of, of decision of the individual committee members. And we have, in this committee, we have uh, people with long expertise in various regions, as well as as uh, the 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 authors of these global checklists. And so most of our changes, as I mentioned, are already um, that are in the uh, 2023 updates uh, were due to w the WGAC process, and that was also true for 2022. And later on, we'll actually get to look at a few of those. Um, forthcoming changes. But first, I think I turn it over to you again now, um, Laura. Yeah, actually, you're you're first up. We're ready oh. for your presentation. So you could okay. you could just keep going. So okay. so now Pam is going to go into um, describing just highlights from uh, species specific highlights for the changes this year. So let's dive into that. Hey. Okay. And I will say it was very difficult to select the changes I found because there are so many uh, that we that were made this year, and yeah. so each one of them is interesting in one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, these are just a few of the affected species that I happen to have photographed at some time in the past. But usually, I only have one. I only have one of the splits, and not the other. But anyway, um, so moving on to the actual. Uh, some the cases that we selected, we tried to select a few cases from different parts of the globe that have sort of different issues involved and um, explain why the changes were made. And uh, obviously, we're going to gloss over the details, <laughs> but because we have to be really, really fast about this. So uh, just a sec. Okay, so one that affects a lot of a lot of birders, a lot of ornithologists as well, is the Tibetan sand plover being recognized. And you will notice also a different genus than you might be familiar with. Um, and Sean will be talking about that later. So now this group of plovers is in the genus Anorhynchus. So we used to have the lesser and the greater sand plover, and it was hard enough to identify them in their non-breeding grounds. Uh, you can see the uh, the range overlap here just in the Indonesian region. Of course, it's not very well known because of the difficulty of identifying them. And these are wide, you know, wide ranging birds. Um, anyway, so so now it's been found that that the lesser that occurs here and basically the uh, Tibetans plateau and a uh, lot of Mongolia um, is quite widely separated from the the Siberian form of the lesser that um, that occurs up here and the greater occurs in the intervening area. There's also an area of sympatry between these two. And it's been found that uh, they're not each other's, these are not each other's closest relatives. So you can't really recognize uh, just one species or sorry, two species um, and have it be a valid conclusion, a valid way of recognizing species. Sean is going to explain about that more in detail later, but for now we just say it's not tenable to recognize two species, nor is it tenable to recognize just one species because we have the sympatry in, on the breeding grounds of Atrophrons and Leshenalti. So uh, they've been split and we're just gonna have to deal with the difficulties on the, on the uh, non-breeding range. And in fact, there's been some really good articles that came out recently and probably more in the works um, that'll help uh, needy people. But there will probably be a lot of um, 
eBird records, for example, that can't retro, you know, retroactively be identified. Okay, another one that affects a lot of people is the cattle grit split. This is one that I've been a, a proponent of for a long time, uh, based on the, I think, extremely different uh, breeding plumage of the Western cattle grit versus the sorry, Eastern versus Western. And um, also they got different proportions, uh, but um, others don't see it as that, you know, as that big of a difference, but really, I mean, the the, the, the texture of the plumes are different. The, the, um, the color is different and obviously the distribution is different. And in fact, this bird looks much more like an intermediate, intermediate egret when it's in non-breeding plumage. And there are a lot of photos that get, uh, that get misidentified. Anyway, unfortunately, there's still no genetic data that sheds any light at all on their, their relationships. There is uh, poor documentation of what seems to be hybridization, both in the Seychelles and the Chagos in the um, uh, Western Indian Ocean, but uh, better documentation would be needed. But even so, that's not necessarily indication that they uh, shouldn't be considered separate species. And we now are considering them separate species based on their um, differentiation in um, over almost all of the globe. Uh, interestingly, the Eastern has self-colonized Australasia. It was native to Asia and the Western, you know, Indonesia and colonized, um, colonized Australia and New Zealand about the same time, maybe a little later than when the uh, Western was self-colonizing the Western Hemisphere from Africa. We know these names are somewhat confusing, but they've been used for a long time. And you know, if you come up with better names, we might be able to consider them. So um, we're always open to suggestions. Um, but on the other hand, we have to remember that, you know, stability is important and they're already pretty entrenched names. Here we have another egret case, uh, again, one that was, I think, long overdue. Uh, bird life split it, and I considered it a separate species in birds of South Asia. Um, but we have two forms with red bills and red legs in breeding plumage, but other differences between them. And obviously, one's in Africa, one's in Australia. Uh, and then we have the Asian form that has a black bill and yellow lowers and black legs in breeding plumage. And one of the confusion issues is that they don't have these breeding plumages for very long at all. So most of the time they look a lot more similar to each other. But again, there's no genetic data. This is a, a sad lack and hopefully somebody listening will be tackling this soon. <laughs> and um, anyway, um, we consider it that it, they're better treated as uh, separate species on the basis of present data. Even vocalizations can't really be brought in, brought to bear at this point because there aren't very many recordings. They're all pretty quiet and uh, we would need to be able to compare good samples of homologous recordings, homologous vocalizations. Okay, another one, um, the necklaced woodpecker. I like this example because it illustrates a couple of points. Um, they are uh, pretty much parapatric as far as we know. We haven't found evidence of uh, intergrades. There could be some, but we don't, you know, there's no evidence yet. Um, there was some confusion about which, you know, which forms went with which group, but that turned out likely to be due to the fact that museum specimens can have the, the head skin sort of pushed up or down, depending on how they're preserved, and they don't show this really key difference in the head pattern between them. Um, and also the juvenile of Catharius looks a lot like the adult of Kernii. Anyway, so we consider them to be separate species. And um, another woodpecker example is the Malabar flameback, uh, which looks very much like the greater flameback, was long considered a subspecies of the greater flameback, has a somewhat shorter crest, is smaller, a bit darker, but not necessarily readily identifiable, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, <clears throat> that was not helpful. <laughs> um. 
maybe Laura, maybe somebody else can talk for a little while and I can get over this. <laughs> <clears throat> Laura, you're muted. So, yeah, so no problem. Take a crack at it. If we, why don't we jump to the next slide though? I think she covered okay. covered the flame backs that have. Oh. Oh, do you want? Uh, Pam, if you can advance the slide, I can try to try to wing it on a less authoritative discussion of the taxonomic changes. <laughs> oh, you know what? My voice is somewhat better all of a sudden, so I'll try it again. No problem. <laughs> Oh, good grief. <clears throat> One lives through these things. Anyway, <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> so we had the uh, the widespread greater flame back. It actually had a bunch of other taxa subtracted from it that were even more different. <clears throat> but uh, it turns out that they're, they're quite vocally different in Southwestern India from the way they are elsewhere. And, um, <clears throat> so we noticed this earlier on. Paul Holt was the first one to bring it to my attention. And then uh, now it's been confirmed with uh, a, a really nice paper. And uh, it's actually, this one was split based on morphology. But the, the Western Ghats one is actually more different vocally and, and in drum rolls than, than the Sri Lankan one is. And um, <clears throat> now, though, we know that of a complication, which is some reports here that we can't really identify so if you can get some recordings from here, maybe we can figure out what's going on there. <clears throat> Sorry. No problem. Okay. If you need more time, Pam? Just I let think us I'm know. better. I, I, I don't know what happened, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> let's see how long it lasts. Okay. So another it really, <laughs> yeah, it happens to me all the time. Another... <laughs> Um, another imp really important one is the split of the Timnit parrot, and this is uh, not universally agreed on by any means, but it's really quite a bit darker uh, with a really dark maroon tail and this pale red area on the beak, and it's much smaller than the more widespread gray parrot that's more familiar. And aviculturists, actually who, people who keep them, have uh, noticed that they have quite a different personality, quite a different demeanor. They're much easier to cater for. They're more, uh, somewhat more playful. They don't tend to pluck their feathers as much, et cetera. But they don't tend to mix with, with gray parrots, even where there's an introduced population um, that, that you would think they would uh, mix. At least it's, they're said not to mix. Now, there needs to be better documentation. And there's also very, very limited evidence of hybridization. And that the cases that I found seem to be um, have have been achieved with quite a bit of difficulty. So <clears throat> unfortunately, the um, this bird has a small range. It's quite uncommon and local even uh, now, particularly because of the uh, the cage bird trade. But um, it's even more popular now because of its personality. So we do have some unresolved issues of the Principi uh, population. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite splits. Uh, because it was kind of unexpected. We all just grew up with uh, the Eclectus parrot being one species, no matter what they looked like. And um, now we have a molecular phylogeny, thanks to Brown et al., that is really congruent with um, with plumage of females, as well as biogeography. And it's a pretty clear uh, case for four-way split. Solomon Islands is a bit more equivocal, could go either way, but this time we, we didn't split it. <clears throat> um, Okay, this is one that is um, split on the basis of one of the best papers I've, I've seen um, by Musher et al. that showed using integrative taxonomy that the bird that I photographed here in Western Ecuador <clears throat> is not even closely related to its lookalike in um, much of South America and Central America. And <clears throat> not even sister species and yet they are extremely similar. Both sexes are extremely similar in plumage. Uh, they also have quite different vocalizations. These are consistently different according to the paper. And now the uh, the distribution has been clarified as well. So this is a really great case of how a you know surprise finding in this earlier paper can then turn out to be um, amplified and, and shown using a variety of types of data to be really very well substantiated. <clears throat> Another, another unexpected one was the finding that the Orioles in Sabah in North 
eastern Borneo were quite different genetically than those from farther west. And um, in fact, the Filipino oriole, which has long been considered a separate species, is nested within the, uh, the Bornean group, if you consider them all to be the same species. So to resolve that paraphyly, you need to consider um, them to be three species, and that's borne out also by the distinctive vocalizations of the um, ventriloquial oriole, Oriolus consubrinus. Uh, how am I doing on time, Laura? Sorry, I lost track of it. <laughs> oh, you're, you're muted. <laughs> I think we have about two to three minutes longer. Okay, okay. This one, um, they look alike, but this one does, in Hispaniola, I know this is a terrible photo. This is my photo, sorry, apologize for that. But it shows this distinctive behavior of the Hispaniolan bird that nobody seems to have documented from the Cuban birds. So get go to Cuba, get some recording, some videos, and and let's find out. But anyway, so far, we have uh, decided that they should be split anyway, based on vocalizations, DNA divergence. Um, but, you know, it'd be helpful to have that, that behavioral information as well. <clears throat> Uh, this one is a case where we made a split based on the data that we had, uh, splitting the Camigan bird, which is very vocally different and also morphologically different. We couldn't uh, split the Sulu bird because we didn't have enough data. But now, um, just as we were preparing the update, suddenly um, Des Allen put a whole bunch of his recordings online from the Sulu Islands, which are very hard to get to. So um, now we could re-examine uh, re the situation, the case. Another really important one, um, the Siberian house martin, and we have uh, a colony that was shown to be composed of both Siberian and Western, formerly common house martin, and they're really quite clearly different in morphology, and they seem to share a breeding colony without hybridizing, so pretty clear case for a split. Okay, uh, one new species, that's the uh, Principe scopsau, Otis Bicagela. I forgot the uh, <laughs> forgot the accento there, but anyway. Oh, um, so I, anyway, um, so here we have the bird on the phylogeny. Obviously, its own clade. Here we have it in a vocal analysis, um, its own uh, group, but also um, close to an unrelated species from Western Ken or the Eastern. Uh, eastern coast of Kenya. Anyway, so this is a, a really good example of how uh, something that was so mysterious for years and years finally has become very well known, extremely well studied in a very comprehensive paper. <clears throat> We're also losing a few species. This is one that probably quite a few people, including myself, regret, but there is really no evidence that this is a separate species. It does have a tiny range and a tiny bit of remnant uh, very endangered habitat, so it's a great conservation concern, but we really can't make the case that it's a species. Indeed, the, the first, the describers didn't consider it a species either. <clears throat> and this one, I think a lot of people are really relieved about, and uh, it's been in the works for a long time, but now the, uh, uh, the evidence is overwhelming that we really shouldn't be recognizing these as separate species. So what else has changed? Well, uh, lots of subspecies, uh, for various reasons. I mentioned these as well, but here's one, the Madagascar wood rail. We changed the name just enough to align it with the, the group that it actually is related to. <clears throat> and um, so here's the, um, the family that includes the, the uh, other forest rails and the, um, the fluff tails <clears throat> and the other wood rails. Um, our monophyletic group in within the rality. So now we have no conflict between, no, we don't have these two different groups that have the same uh, name. And uh, here we have, oh, just a few subspecies that are newly recognized of the brush cuckoo. And another interesting situation with sun bittern, long considered monotypic, but uh, somewhat vocally different. Uh, higher pitched and with more modulation in, in the north, and also gray back versus rufous back, et cetera, and apparently parapatric. So a situation that needs to be looked into. But we we made them groups for now, and, and that they might end up being separate species. No, no guarantees, but it's a possibility. <clears throat> okay, so I think that's my stopping point.
Laura, you're muted. <laughs> I'm so great at that. Um, yeah, so now we're going to go to Sean, who's going to tell us a little bit about how the what species groups and families have been changed. Thanks, Laura. All right. So, um, Pam has just highlighted some of the many exciting changes implemented in this year's update at the species level. Um, but I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, the levels of classification above the species level, i.e. genus and family. And in some ways, uh, defining what a genus and family is can be a bit harder than just uh, deciding what a species is. Before I dive into these changes, I just want to cover some of the basics of how we classify these groups. And this applies to species as well. But for this portion of um, the presentation, I'm focusing on how it applies to genera and families. So in taxonomy, we recognize all of these different categories are leveled, but what are these categories? So in biology, we need a way to communicate about the diversity of life. And there are some general rules to follow so that when we say a genus or family or species, everyone knows what we're talking about. The most important rule is that each named group that we talk about represents a monophyletic group. To think about a monophyletic group, think of a group of species. If that group is monophyletic, it means that every descendant of a single common ancestor is present in that group. If one descendant is excluded, it is no longer monophyletic. By the same token, if something is included that did not descend from that one common ancestor, the group is also no longer monophyletic. And this rule applies to all scales from domain all the way down to subspecies and everything in between, although there are a few exceptions to this rule at the species and subspecies level, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Even before people understood what evolution was and thus what monophyly was, the goals of classification have always been the same. In the Linnaean system of classification, for instance, groups of organisms that looked more similar to each other and shared certain characters or traits were placed in the same group. So to understand monophyly a bit more, let's take a look at a phylogeny. A phylogeny is a visual way to represent how organisms are related to each other. And so in this fictional phylogeny, we have species A through J, and the pattern of branching shows which species are most closely related to each other. The point at which um, a phylogeny branches is called a node. And that node represents the most recent common ancestor of all the branches that come from it. Or put another way, the last time that the species at the end of the branches all shared an ancestor. All of the lineages that share that common ancestor have some set of characteristics in common, and that can be used to classify them and understand how they've evolved. Now, I've mentioned that monophyletic groups are the key to taxonomy and classification, but just what does that look like in a phylogeny? So in this phylogeny, all of the boxes that I've drawn here represent monophyletic groups. Each contains an ancestor and all of its descendants. These monophyletic groups represent the building blocks of taxonomy and classification. Almost every name you see, whether it's a genus, family, or species, represents a monophyletic group, meaning that every individual in that group is more closely related to each other than they are to any other individual in another named group. Finally, Here's a box that does not represent a monophyletic group. The most recent common ancestor of species H, I, and J was here. And so this group excludes all of the other descendants of that single ancestor. So now we know some of the basic rules of creating and recognizing groups, but what actually are these groups? While species are biologically meaningful entities, all other levels of taxonomy, including genus and family, are merely human constructs with no biological meaning. But that doesn't mean they're not still important. They're a way to summarize higher level patterns of evolution, including how groups are related to each other, which can help us to learn about the natural history of poorly known species or how certain traits and behaviors have evolved. But because they're not biological entities, it also gives us a little bit more freedom in how we can actually define them as long as we still follow the general rules of taxonomy. So in the 2023 taxonomy update, we actually added two new families to the list, Hyliidae and Paradoxornithidae. 
And each one of these families represents a different aspect of how and why new families are recognized. In the case of Hyliidae, this was a change that was necessary to maintain monophyly. While in the case of Paradox Ornithidae, monophyly was not being violated per se, but it represents a change in how taxonomists prefer to communicate about these groups. So in Hyliidae, we have two songbirds found in Western and Central Africa, the tit hylia and green hylia. And these two species of long puzzle taxonomists and systematists, having been placed in upwards of seven different families over time and often not being considered each other's closest relative. You can hardly blame early taxonomists for not realizing that these two species, which are so different looking from each other, were actually closely related. The bird on the left, the tit hylia, has seen the most shuffling around, being at times placed with the sunbirds and nectarineidae, the flower peckers and dicaeidae, the pendulum tits and rumizidae, and even the astrilted finches. The green hylia has often been placed with other warblers, historically in the previously large and expansive sylviidae, but more recently with macrosphenidae, a collection of African warbler genera. Early phylogenetic studies and using DNA sequence data were the first to show that these two species were actually um, each other's closest relative. But even with that knowledge, we still did not know how they fit into the bigger radiation of songbirds. In this early phylogenetic study, the red arrows point to the location on the phylogeny where these two species were found. And you'll notice that in two different ways of analyzing the data, two very different results were recovered with um, these two species being found related to different sets of, of species. And this uncertainty comes from the evolutionary age of these uh, two species. They split from their most recent common ancestors so long ago. And in cases like that, phylogenetic analyses can have a really hard time coming to a consensus on relationships. And it wasn't until a larger data sets that sampled thousands of genetic markers were, were published that we were finally able to better place where these two species fit in the larger songbird radiation. Prior to this update, tit hylia and green hylia together had been placed with the macrosphenidae, marked here with the red arrow, with the acknowledgement that their inclusion there was not well supported by current evidence, and a lot of evidence actually suggesting that they should be placed in their own family. And as you can see in this comprehensive phylogeny of the major lineages of songbirds, green hylia and tit hylia were instead found to fall out here, marked with this red arrow on the phylogeny. Clearly by the rule of monophyly that is so crucial to taxonomy, their placement in Macrosphenidae cannot stand. And given their distinct appearance, deep genetic divergence, and lack of other close relatives, they're best treated in the separate family, Hyliidae. Now, contrary to Hyliidae, uh, the parrot bills and their allies are definitely a bit less enigmatic from a taxonomy perspective, although they too have seen their share of upheaval and change over time. For one, the members of this family have not always been grouped together, with the parrot bills often grouped separately from the others, like Fulvetas, Babblers, and the Rentit of North America. And also unlike Hyliidae, our decision to recognize Paradox Ornithidae as a distinct family was less about preserving monophyly and more about improving our communication about songbird families by separating the morphologically and genetically distinct parrot bills and, the, and their allies from birds uh, like the Sylvia and Curaca warblers. Thanks to a series of excellent papers on the phylogenetic relationships of the babblers and their allies, we were able to fairly quickly sort out the relationships among these various groups. As you can see here, the parrot bills and their allies outlined in red form a monophyletic group, while the Sylvia warblers also form a monophyletic group. And these two groups together are each other's closest relative and themselves form a monophyletic group outlined in blue. Up until the 2023 taxonomy update, we had elected to treat the Sylvia warblers and parrot bills together as a single family with, this, with the name Sylviidae having priority. In a more recent study that sampled almost every species in the diverse babbler assemblage, which also includes the parrot bills, the sylvia warblers, the white eyes, and many other things, we can again see that these two groups form very well-supported monophyletic clades, with the dark blue 
clade A, representing the Sylvia warblers, turquoise clade B, representing the parrotbills and their allies, and pink clade C, representing the white eyes and their allies. Again, you can see that the warblers and parrotbills are each other's closest relative and form a monophyletic group. So recognizing Paradox Ornithidae as distinct wasn't strictly necessary to maintain monophyly, but it was the consensus of taxonomists that these two groups were different enough, genetically divergent from each other, and were best treated as separate families to better communicate uh, aspects of their evolution and diversification. So in addition to the two newly recognized families on the Clements checklist, many changes were made to genera from recognizing new genera to shuffling species around to different genera. And Pam um, already alluded to uh, this change in, in plover uh, genera, but I'm gonna dive into this a little bit more. And so in none of these changes are perhaps as large and impactful to a global birding audience than the breakup of the plover genus Shiradrius. And the genus Shiradrius was until October of this year, uh, the largest genus of plovers and generally could be recognized as like the ringed plovers. So that includes killdeer, semi-palmated and common ringed plover, piping plover, the sand plovers, pentish and snowy plover, chestnut banded plover, and many others. And other plovers thought to be closely related to the Shiradrius plovers, but placed in separate genera, included the shore plover and hooded plover and Thanornis, and the rye bill in the monotypic genus Anorhynchus. In this phylogenetic study using genetic data, though, we can see the reason for making changes in how we classify the genus Shiradrius. The traditional genus Shiradrius is not monophyletic and is broken apart mainly by the Vanellus lapwings, which are a highly distinctive group of plovers. So based on the rule of monophyly in taxonomy and classification, change was needed. To correct this, two approaches were possible. The one we adopted, where Shiradrius was broken up into multiple genera, or we could have merged Finellus into an expanded Shiradrius. However, that approach was not taken because of the highly distinctive nature of the Vanellus lapwings, as well as the deep genetic divergence of these groups. Merging them together would have created a very heterogeneous collection of birds, and the preference was to retain the lapwings in their own genus. Because the type specimen of the genus Shiradrius was common ringed plover, the name Shiradrius stays with the clade that species is in while the other clade need, needed a new name, which turns out to be Anorhynchus, which was originally applied only to the rye bill of New Zealand, but which is imbe actually embedded within this group. Also now included in the new collection of Shiradrius are some of the smaller genera of plovers like Thanornis and Elciornis. So in the plovers, the genus Shiradrius has now shrunk from 30 something species to 11 species, but it also includes some new members, like I said, the shore plover and hooded plover, previously included in Thanornis. And the genus Anorhynchus has grown from one species to 24 species and includes the morphologically very distinct rye bill as well as the many, as well as many of the ringed plovers previously in Shiradrius. There are many other interesting genus level changes, but I don't have time to get into those right now. But if we have time at the end, we can talk uh, more about some of those. All right, thank you so much, Sean. It's fascinating. All right, so so the, we got a question in the chat in the Q and A actually that tees up Marshall's next su subject about undescribed types. So let me read the question: How does Eber decide when to change something classified currently classified as an undescribed type? In Costa Rica, for example, for example, previously a population of megascops owls in the South Pacific was treated as a variant vicariant population of Choco screech owl. Now in Eber, they're showing as Putorena screech owl, an undescribed type. In uh, Costa Rica, we expected it to be given species status for a while due to its distinct vocalizations, but what is the driver between creating an undescribed type and it not being reportable as a species versus, versus the traditional species split method of leaving it as a population of a full species until a full determination is made? Thank you, Tyler, for that question and go for it, Marshall. Uh, yeah, so just first, that was an awesome summary of, uh, of monophyly and, and all the decisions going into that, Sean. Um, and I, I just want to say one, one cool thing about the plovers is once this 
once that genus split has gone into place, it sort of made me look at these birds that I associated together for a long time, like, you know, snowy or Kentish plover and common ringed or, or semi-palmated plover. I'd always sort of thought of them together, but now sort of as I'm taking on board this genus change, I realize like the calls are really different. You know, all those, the semi-palmated and ringed group gives these poes or chewy or kill deer type sort of musical calls. And all the all the ones in Anarhynchus are like these little chit or chirp or, or kip notes. Um, so the calls are different, like the the aerial displays of kill deer and semi-palmated and ring plovers are, are something that I don't think we see as much in Anarhynchus. So it's really fun when these taxonomic changes sort of like help you out as a field birder. Um, yeah, so to get back to the question, um, I thought it would be good to give a sort of an overview of, you know, sometimes we talk about the eBird taxonomy and the Clements taxonomy, and sometimes we talk about the eBird slash Clements taxonomy. Um, so that the taxonomy that we're discussing here is sort of the framework um, that we use at the Cornell Lab to organize all this information that we're collecting. And it it's information on observations and photos and sound recordings. It's, um, you know, Merlin models that are that are learning to identify birds by by their vocalizations. It's, you know, th this really rich uh, narrative and sort of scientific literature in in birds of the world. Um, so the, the taxonomy that we use is, is the backbone of all that. So obviously it's really important that we stay current and as accurate as we can um, on the taxonomy. Um, so the Clements taxonomy is, is really restricted to the species, but you know, it's, it's all embedded in this higher level structure of families and orders and, and genera, but, but, um, but it, it's sort of at, at the, at the tip level, it's a species or a subspecies. And then we have this, this sort of um, a bit more ambiguous notion of a subspecies group. So those are sort of potential future species, potential, you know, potential taxa to watch that are um, morphologically distinct or vocally distinct. Um, and, and we maintain that to sort of better organize the data. So you can look at the differences between a yellow rumped warbler that's of the Audubon subspecies group or the myrtle subspecies group. You can listen to the, the call differences. You can look at the plumage differences. Um, so that's sort of the, like the, the Clements structure. In eBird, we, we have, you know, we have those species, we have those subspecies groups, but we, we have a hard enough time sort of vetting global data on, on really difficult to identify species. So if you think about in the new world, willow flycatcher actually had, or, or sorry, Western wood peewee actually has four described subspecies. Um, it's really hard to tell a peewee apart to start with. Um, but the, you know, the subspecies are sort of really, really subtle, subtle things. So we provide this group structure um, and we don't provide groups in, in Western wood peewee. So the subspecies are sort of part of the, the official nomenclature in Clements, but, but we don't provide those as data entry options in, in eBird. Um, Willow warbler would be a good old world example. Also has four subspecies, really subtle to tell those subspecies apart. And it's hard enough to get your, get your species right when you're in the, in the genus Phoscopus. Um, but the thing that eBird does provide is sort of these additional taxa that, that field birders encounter. And that can be, I want to just report it as a Philoscopus warbler, because I'm not sure if it's a willow warbler or chiff chaff, or I just want to report it as a wood peewee, because I'm not sure if it's an eastern or a western or a tropical wood peewee. Um, uh, so, so we provide, provide sort of what we call slashes or spas, so you can report eastern slash western wood peewee, or you can report flycatcher spa. Um, and that that lets the field birder be accurate. If you post a photo and you're not sure what the identification is, you can post it as a as a flycatcher spa or a peewee spa or or a, a passerine spa. Um, so that's really important for the field birders. You also sometimes encounter hybrids. We'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. Um, so we we have hybrids in in eBird. We have intergrades. Sometimes like a myrtle or an Audubon's warbler can get together and, and hybridize. We refer to those as intergrades since it's a mix between two subspecies groups rather than between two species. Um, we maintain domestic taxa for sort of those um, white and piebald Muscovy ducks or or city feral pigeons um, that are that are sort of their ancestry relates to to humans that have domesticated them and then released them into the wild. Um, and then the other thing that we have is is this sort of catch all for everything else, which we refer to as forms. So these tend to be like not formally described taxa, but 
usually things that have this mounting amount of evidence that maybe this is a, a, a full species that's sitting under our nose. So on the right side is Inti tanager, which was just formally described in a scientific paper and recognized uh, just last year. Really exciting bird that, that we've known about for something like 20 years. Um, long, long, complicated, interesting story for sort of um, why that bird had a long road to uh, taxonomic description, but now it now it has a name. Now, now it's sort of in the in all the all the global taxonomies as a full species. But this wood quail on the left, um, people have just started to realize that wood quails in this specific area of Peru seem to look different from any known species of of wood quail. Occur in an area where there may well be. Um, be some endemism that's that's hiding under our nose and is a real interesting species to watch. Um, but there you can see that by adding this, now we have uh, 20 observations from that area, uh, just this single photo of the bird and two audio recordings. So it's it should be a real call to action to anyone visiting this part of, of Peru to, to track down this bird, help us collect more photos and audio um, to help understand how this bird relates to other wood quail around it. And uh, and 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 help to establish its range. It, it may be more wide widespread than this one or two localities that it's occurred. Um, so I can step through a couple of the other changes from this year. And there's the the screech owl that the question was asked about on the left. Um, Punta Arenas screech owl. Um, up to up to this year, we had treated those as probably part of Choco screech owl, which was a recent split from the vermiculated screech owl complex that got divided into Middle American screech owl, Choco screech owl, and Guiana screech owl. I'm oh, sorry, Foothill screech owl. Um, but but these birds in in sort of um, southeastern Costa Rica show um, a fairly different vocalization from Choco that is is similar enough that it had been sort of um, treated as treated as the same species up to this point. But with this taxonomic update, now we're we're sort of officially saying, no, we think these are different. We're still hoping for sort of the formal um, taxonomic study and vocal analysis that'll that'll help answer that question. Um, but it's a it's a way for us to start organizing this data. So we already have all these photos and video um, that you can see on the, on that page if you go to it now. Um, the Timor nightjar is another interesting case. Large shield nightjar is super widespread in Southeast Asia. Um, but the ones on on Timor and a few of the adjacent islands have a have a quite distinct call. They give a lot more uh, call notes in a given series, and is almost certainly another good species, especially given the the importance of vocalizations in night jars. But we don't have a single photo in in the Macaulay Library archive yet, even though 104 people um, have reported observations of them. And then Pam had shown uh, brush cuckoo. That whole cacamantis complex is going through a big set of revisions that we can probably expect to see in our eBird and Birds of the World accounts next year. Um, but this uh, tenon bar population is is vocally distinct, seems to be visually distinct, and and doesn't have a name yet. So um, so we have these undescribed taxa when there's not a formal scientific paper that has uh, given the bird a name in a peer reviewed publication. Um, but it's really important for us to be able to organize this information as it comes along. So hopefully that hopefully that sort of answers that. And this is something you'll find only in sort of eBird and the eBird uh, environment. Um, you may find mention of it in some of the, the the Birds of the World accounts that there's an undescribed taxon on Tenon Bar that we're waiting for a name on. But um, but that's one of the distinctions between Clements being sort of like formal published a defensible taxonomy and eBird can be a little bit looser and sort of a, a little bit more uh, able to react with the times as people discover new and exciting things. Um, so to continue on new and exciting, I, I get a real kick out of this each year. Um, every year people are finding new hybrid, um, hybrid birds and um, we don't sort of try to predict what these will be. So there's always sort of a year time lag from someone finding some new interesting hybrid and us adding that option for eBird records. But when we know that one's been seen, then we can go back to those observations and change into the hybrid once we um, go through the steps of our taxonomic update. So I'll step through a few of these. At the top left is a, a black stork that ended up mating with a white stork in Germany and produced these gray stork hybrid young. Um, so that's that's one that was added this year. These two babies are, are the only photos we have of, of a black 
and white stork hybrid. Um, at the bottom left is a hybrid between hairy woodpecker and white-headed woodpecker, which um, which was photographed in California. I think there's two two observations of birds like that that seem to be seem to be that hybrid. And then this one on the right, I absolutely love. It's uh, there's a flock of ruddy turnstones, and in the flock is a is a, a apparently a white rumped ruddy turnstone hybrid. Um, you can see the little little bit of pink at the base of the bill. That's a white rumped character. There's actually some flight shots of this bird uh, that show too, but really sort of exciting and just just wild hybrid to imagine those two birds getting together. Um, I'll do a, do a few more. There's um, uh, golden bellied and blue fronted star frontlet uh, from from Bogota, Colombia, in the top left. In the middle, we have a, a mountain Mexican chickadee hybrid uh, from the Chiricahua Mountains in Arizona. Um, the bird on the right, if you saw that in the field, you could sort of casually pass that off as a scarlet tanager with those black wings. But when you see the red on the wings and sort of the, the bill size, you realize it's actually a scarlet summer tanager hybrid. Um, and then this bottom row is all uh, American wood warblers. Um, on the left is a American red start magnolia warbler hybrid that was photographed in Ontario. In the middle is another magnolia warbler hybrid, but this time with the Cape May warbler from Texas. And then on the right is a is a pretty subtle subtle bird. It looks a little bit like a like a yellow rumped warbler with too much yellow in the face. Um, so it's actually a, a hermit yellow rumped warbler, a hermit Audubon's warbler hybrid from Los Angeles. Um, so I figured I'd do two more that are kind of fun. Uh, there's a goose on the left and a dove on the right. And I'll just pause here for a quick second while you guys think mm -hmm. what, what hybrid combination do you think these are? Um, and while I do that, I'll say that anytime someone sort of reports a hybrid, we try to, we try to vet it with as many experts as we can. It's often sort of educated guesswork for what, you know, what these parents are. We don't always have genetics or, or like observation of the birds actually mating and producing young, like with that, with that stork hybrid. Um, so it's sort of best guesswork from, um, from the situation, the likely pairings and, and the appearance of the bird. Um, so here on the left, uh, looks like I, I didn't drop the other photo in, but on the left is a tundra bean goose and a greater white fronted goose from Germany. And then on the right is from British Columbia, where these birds were reported as oriental turtle doves um, from, a, from a feeder in British Columbia. But in fact, it looks like um, there had been a vagrant oriental turtle dove there that found the local Eurasian collar doves and mated with those to produce actually two hybrid hybrid juveniles. Um, so I always get excited about these hybrids, but at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean, who's gonna uh, just talk a little bit more about hybrid hybridization in birds and why it's cool. Yeah, thanks, Marshall. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I... I love hybridization too. And in addition to um, just being really fun and exciting to try to identify um, with, you know, all their fun assortment of plumage characteristics that mix and match different features of each parent. Hybrids also represent a really important component in the study of evolution and speciation. Um, as Marshall mentioned, hybridization in birds is actually rather common and widespread. Um, and it's estimated that 10% of all bird species um, hybridize or have hybridized. Um, while some may be one-off events like the Cape May Magnolia Warbler hybrid that Marshall showed us, others hybridize much more frequently and understanding what happens when these species do hybridize is a fascinating field of study. And in studying hybridization, one of the most important things to know is the frequency of hybridization and where those hybridization events occur. And just by knowing those two things, we can learn a lot about the fitness of hybrids, what factors might be contributing to hybridization and whether hybridization is changing over time. And I mean, uh, again, I love hybridization and everything about it. Um, I studied hybridization uh, for both my postdoc and PhD work. And in grad school, I studied uh, hybridization between red-naped and red-breasted sapsuckers. And I used hybrid ob observations that were submitted to eBird as part of my research. Uh, the ranges of these two species overlaps in parts of California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. And where their ranges do overlap, they hybridize regularly and form what we call a hybrid zone. 
And one thing that really fascinated me about this particular hybrid zone was the fact that it has moved over time. And I really wanted to know why. And using data from museum specimens, as well as observations from eBird, I was able to find that climate change appears to be an important factor in, co in causing this movement. In particular, I found that the area where these species hybridize has shifted from west to east over time, with red-breasted sapsuckers expanding and red-naped sapsuckers retreating. And this was especially evident in the Warner, Mount Warner Mountains of northeastern California and south central Oregon, where there has been repeated studies of sapsuckers um, dating to the early 1900s. So in this area, rent nape sapsuckers were the dominant species present in the early 1900s. But by 1964, uh, rent nape and red breasted sapsuckers were equally abundant and hybridizing. And when I visited those locations between 2011 and 2013, um, we found only one or two red nape sapsuckers and many, many red breasted sapsuckers and red breasted sapsucker like hybrids. And in addition to the shift there, we also found that red-breasted sapsuckers were expanding east into the Ochoco Mountains in central Oregon. And the reasons for these changes are complex and multifaceted, but one thing we were able to show is that these changes followed closely changes in climate in the area, with each species seeming to track their uh, climate niche over a period of 50 years or so. In another study of hybridization that used eBird data and uh, eBird submissions of, of hybrids, uh, Catherine Grabenstein and colleagues found that hybridization between mountain chickadee and black cap chickadee in the Rocky Mountain region of North America increased in areas with human habitat disturbance, such as around towns and cities. And in the case of these two species, unlike in the sapsuckers that I studied, their ranges actually overlap over a really large area um, and not just in a narrow zone. However, despite this huge area of overlap, Hybridization between them is relatively rare, though geographically widespread, except around areas of human habitat disturbance. Grabenstein and our colleagues hypothesize that human modified habitats have artificially broken down the ecological barriers between these two species by creating an environment that is suitable for both to coexist in, and by possibly also reducing selection against hybrids through supplemental feeding at bird feeders. And so the documentation of hybrid chickadees and many other species in eBird um, is crucial to help scientists further understand how human-caused modifications to the landscape impact hybridization, um, which could have really serious implications for conservation efforts in some species. And if you're interested in learning more about hybrids and hybridization in birds, you can also check out the relatively new hybridization section in Birds of the World, which features photos, that have been submitted to eBird that illustrate what these hybrids look like, as well as what we know about hybridization in these species. And I just want to note that this section is still new and very much a work in progress, so we're continuously adding content as accounts get updated. You're muted, Laura. Of course I am. Um, somebody wrote a question that Marshall answered, but I thought it was worth calling, can hybrids eventually become new species? To be clear, I answered and said, Sean or Pam should answer this one. <laughs> but, I, yes. but I mentioned Italian sparrow, so. So it's yes. very, yeah, Italian sparrow yeah. is a documented case where, where the Italian sparrow is the product of hybridization between house and Spanish sparrow, but there are very, very few cases. Maybe Sean can say more. Yeah, it's a it's a very rare uh, circumstance, and it requires just like the perfect set of conditions to actually happen. And like Pam and Marshall said, the Italian sparrow is probably the best example that we have really good evidence for. Um, but there is a couple of other um, uh, instances. There is a mannequin hybrid that might be a good candidate for a hybrid species. Um, but this this really rare in birds. Um, it's more common in um, other systems. It's fairly common in plants, um, but it is possible. Um, but evidence for it is pretty hard, and it's hard to um, confirm um, with even with a lot of study. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, great. I just want to remind the audience that last season we did a webinar, or Sean and Catherine Gravenstein did a webinar just devoted to hybridization. So if you want to look that up, we've dropped the link in the chat, and you could also visit the Birds of the World website and click on the news slash webinar to find that. So thank you so much. Um, we're doing great on time, so thank you. Uh, we've got about nine minutes left, and we have, um, let's see... So we answered that one. I'm going to ask, somebody asked about prothonotary warbler. I don't know if you have an opinion on this. Um, I, I, somebody asked about why don't we change the hard to pronounce name of prothonotary warbler to it's easier to pronounce an etymologically correct prothonotary warbler. Um, and the reason is the change drops the awkward H and places the emphasis on the first syllable rather than the second. The warbler is named after the cape of a proto notary, which means the most, the first or most senior proto record keeper or notary. Churches and governments have proto notaries for the purpose of recording births, deaths, marriages, and land titles. I don't know if any of you have any insights or, or opinions on that, but we, but if you do, let's hear it. So the name is. A change of that name would would violate stability, of course, and and uh, um, it is yeah it is difficult to pronounce, no, no question. But we have a limited set of names that have been uh, determined by the AOS Council uh, that will be changed, and that's not among them. But mm -hmm. that's not you know uh, it would be helpful to have maybe some guidelines on how to pronounce it, uh, maybe right. in Birds of the World or something. I don't know. That just a just a thought. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Does anyone, um, do, do anyone on our panel have any other species that they want to delve into? Any other, you know, like really exciting changes or, or vexing changes uh, that, or any, any, any ideas about what's coming down the pike in terms of what changes are going to happen? Yeah, I have, I have some of that. Good. Oh, what's next? Everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, well, so we decided that maybe for the first time ever, we're going to do a version two. I'm not sure it's the first time ever, but we're going to uh, publish some revised range statements for Clements uh, 2023. So hopefully there'll be um, updated, improved range statements that'll be more useful. And um, so if you have a if you have any suggestions, if you have, find a problem with range statements, et cetera, um, send them to us. Cornell Birds will forward things that, uh, you know, to us as needed. So um, feel free. We're, we're happy to entertain. Please don't just look at, at the, at the uh, spreadsheet and see mistakes and just, you know, stay quiet about it. We want to hear about mistakes or things that, that could be improved. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't change any species level uh, issues or any names until the next October 2024 update. So that's set in stone for now. So again, any change, I mean, any issues you find, any problems you find, let us know, but don't expect those to be changed until the next full update. Uh, we already have quite a few WGAC changes that are decided and being determined uh, this month even and in, over the next few months. Um, not as many, I don't think, as we've had in the past couple of years, but here's a sneak preview. Um, this is a, a, a Western form and the uh, more widely distributed a Central, Af mainly Central African form of a sunbird uh, formerly called gray-throated, or sorry, gray-chinned. Now we're, we're um, splitting them based on the WGAC decision, based on their parapatric distribution and really quite different uh, plumages as well as vocalizations. And um, Here's another one that's in, in progress. Um, I can't say what the result will be, but I, <laughs> I'm pretty sure uh, it's not going to be one species. So um, anyway, we've got the two Philippine birds that are much, much smaller and widely disjunct from these others, um, Malay, Borneo region and Sulawesi region birds. And the vocalizations are just incredibly different. I've I've heard heard all of these a lot I haven't haven't I tried for this last May and May and failed it's quite they're quite rare actually in the Philippines but anyway um, those are some things that we're looking at it's still being voted on so no definitive answer yet and we do have uh, an end in sight for the 
initial alignment phase of WGAC uh, likely to be done by about February. Is that right, Marshall? Yeah, okay. And so we're then going to be moving on to the next phase and probably adding some additional um, people in the committee, different sub, you know, subcommittees, et cetera. Um, so it's pretty exciting to see the next phase uh, coming into view uh, where we're going to be dealing with subspecies, higher taxonomy more, and um, also new studies like the long-awaited paper that is really, I think, going to allow us to finally deal with the world's most polytypic bird species. Again, I can't promise what's going to happen, but I have some I have some thoughts on the matter, and the paper is uh, is really going to make a you know make it uh, a a viable pro uh, pro pro process. Sorry. Okay. So um, I had some additional slides, but we don't need to go through them. Um. Actually, the one that you teed up was was going to be my next question. You know, okay. throughout, throughout all of your yeah, throughout all of your um, discussions, there's been a call to action, and it's the use of you know photos and sound recordings to make these determinations. So both Pam and Marshall, I'd love to hear from you on that. Uh, well, basically, how have we taxonomists been using citizen science archives? Well, in all kinds of ways, they're invaluable. It makes a huge difference. We can, uh, you know, we, we can make indirect comparisons. We have to remember that you can't necessarily compare the, the color, the exact shades of color in photographs like you can in series of specimens. There are pitfalls, there are shortcomings. And of course, we have to remember that identification can be an issue. And when we find a misidentified photo, we, we flag it. So please do the same as what, when you find them. Uh, so reviewers can check, even if, uh, I mean, it, it might turn out that it's correct, but um, you know, if somebody needs to check it, then then we need to do that. So um, that system is in place. We shouldn't just allow misidentified photos to stay that way. Um, we often can zero in on hybrid zones or or zones of parapatry, um, whether there's intergradation happening. If we have photos available to us. Never before in history has it been possible to do all this just based on freely available online resources. Uh, here's an example where Pam, I was just going to give one 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 additional point about the benefit of photos is that um, there's there's so many so many taxa that have sort of been shown to have fairly subtle plumage differences, but then the soft parts, so the eye, the bill, and the and the legs, um, may have really striking differences. And those those can really show up well in in the good photo photo archives that are being amassed in Macaulay Library, but you can't see them at all on on specimens. Sometimes the collectors noted that specifically, and and that's been used in the past. But but um, the ability to see if something has a pale versus a dark iris mm -hmm. is uh, is something that um, we really have an opportunity to clarify um, that aspect. And, and if yeah, I could and that brings that to mind for okay. a second um the photos that you upload don't always have to be beautiful profile photos you know it's not a competition mm -hmm. for for how beautiful your photo is to get on a calendar or anything like that it's really about seeing the bird in its habitat and various angles those kind of things can be really valuable and it just in the last year or two there was a paper published on a new subspecies of a bulbo i think rubigula dispar matamera which means red eye um and uh it's a, it's a, I forget which one is which, but I didn't have time to cover it today, but um, it was based on a difference in eye color between the Sumatran and, and Javan populations, as I recall. Uh, sorry if I got some details wrong there, but, but anyway, so that's an example of how um, these archives of photos can be really invaluable and help us uncover this kind of thing. Here's an example of how the archives can uh, basically make it more difficult to 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 split. Um, there was there was a study that showed very deep divergence of mtDNA between two described taxa uh, taxon groups of mealy parrot, and so uh, HBW split it, and uh, IOC WBL world or excuse me world birdless split it. There's also quite a few morphological differences, but again there is complications with with racial variation, etc. Um, but Vocal analyses didn't confirm differences, and turns out that if you look at, at just look through photos at uh, 
on the archives, you find all kinds of intermediate birds over a very wide area, especially in Panama, that really is not uh, uh, compatible with there being separate species under the BFC. So it's possible that they might be split in the future with further study, but the um, you know initial initial analyses didn't support that. And how about sound recordings? Well, um, it depends on the bird whether sound recordings are really going to be that. Uh, valuable in uh, doing taxonomy, but with those many groups of birds that have stereotyped voice, um, the voice is incredibly important in, um, in taxonomy as it is to the species recognition of the birds themselves. So ideally, we would have for before we acted on a uh, on a case, we would have, you know, proper scientific analysis using known homologous vocal types, two way control, breeding season, playback experiments. There's a whole lot more to doing a good playback experiment than than just you know playing some a recording and seeing if your, the bird comes in. But uh, usually we don't have that stuff. So we can in many cases we can make judgments uh, using the vocalizations as a as a co uh, corroborating type of, of data um, based on on uh, analyses that that were already done by by Bozeman etc cetera, et cetera. and um, often however there's insufficient material often it turns out there's a lot of complexity and and many birds have incredibly complex vocal repertoires and we also have to deal with the fact that there might be misidentified recordings in some of the uh, archives. So uh, we have, have to remember we have dialects um, and it's hard to know sometimes whether you're dealing with a dialect or true differences between taxa that might be species level differences. So uh, shall I continue with this, Laura, or? How about one more minute? Can you? Okay, uh, so how can you contribute more to taxonomy if you'd like to do that. Uh, well, uh, uh, when you're birding, try to find places that may not have already have a lot of, of, of records and maybe you can contribute to uh, um, information on species you know that aren't even known from those places or that may help to narrow down contact zones or areas of peripatry. The more media you take, the better. Then the more documentation that you keep, for those media, I know it's it's tedious and it's a, it's takes time, but the more documentation, the better. And then upload it and make you know make it accessible. Um, let people know. Let taxonomists know if you find things that that seem new, that seem that don't square with uh, the current taxonomic treatment. And often um, there can be collaboration with taxonomists or. Uh, or we can, you know, that use th those types of data as corroborating data. Or, um, and we have a lot of available material now that is just there for the analysis. Uh, the problem really is lack of people doing analyses more than, in a lot of cases, the availability of material. And this is, again, the first time in history this has been true. But here's an example of this this new paper that ended up splitting the uh, chirruping nightjar um, it also recommended a split of this group as well, but um, this this new paper is based largely on online material that can you know th there's many many cases where we have the material now anybody can uh, access it and um, the analyses are just waiting to be done and then there are many other cases where we need more material and these birds are common like the lesser and quote unquote lesser Antillean pee -wee. I'm convinced it needs to be split but we don't have enough information. We don't have enough recordings. So they're not hard. it's not hard to get to these places. A lot of people already live there and can easily get recordings on your phone even if you don't have specialized equipment. And it's easier now than ever. Just, just need those, those recordings and then we, uh, we can get some analyses done and take some action. Mm -hmm. So very quickly, um, we see a lot of taxonomic inertia and that leads to a lack of interest in some very interesting taxa, like this house wren that I photographed in Dominica and this Galapagos barn owl, very likely to be split in the future when, <laughs> when the analyses are done. Um, and it, it has a lot of knock-on effects, but we can't allow those kinds of knock-on effects to drive the taxonomic uh, decisions. So that's an important issue as well.
However tempting it is, that's like the example of the Rustinga ant wren that was lumped. You know, we, we, don't, we don't like to do it because we know it leads to less likelihood of the, the bird being conserved in the future, but the evidence doesn't support its specific status. So I'll stop there. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so Sean and Marshall, do you have anything to add on that thought or? Okay. Not really, that was amazingly thorough. I, I would just say <laughs> that, um, that I, I mean, for me, uh, I keep regular eBird checklists and, and having the specific location tied to the track data is really important for eBird science. So turn your tracks on count your birds, do a good eBird checklist. And then when you add the media into that I, and audio recordings into that list, then the location, species identification and the structured taxonomy, um, any, you know, any field notes that you observed about the birds, it's really sort of the digital journal um, of the future that we we all hope to be using and the, the opportunity to illustrate it with, with photos and sounds can be really useful above and beyond the taxonomic questions. Um, obviously we're um, working hard to do sound ID with Merlin and having lots and lots of examples um, and also photo ID with Merlin, lots and lots of examples is, is what those AI projects need. So we're really sort of data hungry for, for media and, and really grateful to those of you who already use eBird and upload your photos and sound recordings. So um, please keep it up. Um, but yeah, I, I think, the very most valuable are these recordings of rare taxa from from rarely visited places that can can answer just the real fundamentals of what is a species. Is there any um, effort to put together a list of these species of the you know these complex species that um, so that would be a, like a motivating would motivate people to go to these particular areas. Or is that something like that sounds like, like a great webinar topic, Laura? We should exactly. <laughs> it's, it's I mean, aspirational. It. Yes, we're planning. We're planning to okay. do that. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk about a webinar. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I think that that's all we can take because we've got one thirty-eight. But I really appreciate you guys being here and the audience for coming to another Birds of the World seminar. Um, if there's anything we can do, let us know, but I uh, want to let you know that next next um, January, our, our next webinar is in January, and we're going to be featuring doc Dr. Stephen Debus from Australia, and he'll be talking about the Black Falcons. So thank you very much. Uh, go to the Birds of the World blog if you want to see any future webinars, and we'll close it with that. But again, thank you all, and uh, to be continued. There's so much on this topic. All right. Thanks. Take care, everybody. All righty.